Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me for what I'm ashamed to say is my first visit ever to Liverpool. Um, I'm going to talk about, well, as you can see there, climate change and what we do about it from a health perspective. And I'll try and cover four things. I'll, I always feel obliged to do a little bit of uh, background about climate change science to put it into context, not because I think it, most people need any education on it, but just so that we all have the same uh, understanding or you understand where I uh, interpret climate change. Then I'll talk a bit about the health implications, but not so much. I'll, most of what I intend to talk about is more our reaction, our responses to it, and whether there are particular benefits for public health. Um, well, this sort of curve, I'm sure, or these curves, are the sort of things that I'm sure you'll have seen many times in the past. They represent um, the trends over the last century or so for our energy use, um, and they show how much things have risen over that time. There are CO2 emissions which relentlessly go upwards. The only things which ever bring about these little dips are when there is a global recession, but essentially otherwise it just goes up relentlessly. Um, also on an absolute scale is, the, is this monitoring data from the uh, Mauna Loa volcano in, uh, on Hawaii. Uh, and it's located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, as far away as it can be from industrial sites, uh, to try to provide a, an uncontaminated trace of what the CO2 uh, levels in the atmosphere are doing. And you can see they've got a bit of a sawtooth pattern, and that's because there is more land area in the northern hemisphere, so when we in our summer there is greenery and growth, CO2 levels fall a bit. When we go into our winter, there is a net, uh, 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 a net emission of CO2, and it goes back up again. So there's, a, there's an annual sawtooth, but you can see that the trend is relentlessly upwards. Uh, this is where we were approximately in the pre-industrial era at about 280 parts per million. We are now close to 390 parts per million and rising rapidly. Um, now this is a, a, a reconstruction. This is a very long time scale. You will have, uh, many of you will have seen something like this as well, I think. This, uh, these are records generated from ice cores in the Vostok ice station, which is in, I think, the Russian sector of Ant Antarctica. And they literally have drilled down uh, into, uh, I think, m several kilometers, probably by now, into the, uh, into the sheet ice. And from that, you pull the ice core out and then you chop it up, and you can do two things. You can measure isotopic ratios in it, and you can measure gases trapped in ice bubbles, uh, bubbles in the ice. And from the... Uh, the gas bubbles, you can determine the concentration of atmospheric constituents a long time in the past, and from the isotopic ratios, you can construct temperatures. Now, this is what the trace shows. Um, uh, you read the x-axis backwards, so here is today, and these are hundreds of thousands of years into the past, so that's 400,000 years ago. Um, and there are two traces. The red curve is the CO2 concentration constructed from the bubbles, and the blue curves are the temperatures constructed from the isotope ratios. And as you can see, that there are periods, brief periods, of warm temperatures. And we're in one of them just now. But for the vast majority of the time, uh, we're in an ice age. And if you think that uh, global warming is a trouble, uh, imagine what it will be when we, as inevitably we will do, go back into an ice age when we'd be probably under about a kilometre of ice here. Uh, it's a very different world, and that's the way the world is for most of the time. So we have a relatively short, brief period of, of warm temperatures. Um, but the concern is, of course, where, where we go upwards from here, and uh, that is the pre-industrial level of CO2. That is the current level of CO2, and it is already probably higher than it's been for two or three million years. Uh, and if we are incredibly successful... Um, we may, hopefully, be able to level off at our CO equivalent levels at around about 550 parts per million. But that's not the trajectory we're on at the moment. We're, our trajectory will take us way beyond that. Um, and if you add in the, non, uh, the, uh, the greenhouse gases other than CO2, our CO2 equivalent is around about there. So we are already in very uncharted territory. And whatever you think of the, uh, uh, your views about the driving force of climate change, this is, this is uncomfortable in that we have, we're in a place that we haven't been um, for a jolly long time, even geologically speaking. 
Now, one of the other things that you will note about this, and one of the things that people have commented on, is the relationship between the, the red and the blue, between the CO2 levels and the temperature. But, of course, if you think about that, it's, it seems strange, actually, because why should there be uh, a correlation? Everyone says, well, it's obvious that CO2 levels cause global warming. We know that. But what changed these CO2 levels? Those CO2 levels actually, uh, there's no man, uh, not enough man, to change these concentrations. This is entirely driven the other way around, in fact. This, these glacial cycles are entirely driven by changes in the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. There are three major cycles. The eccentricity of our orbit varies. The tilt of our Earth axis varies. And the wobble, uh, the precession of our Earth, um, that also varies. And they have different cycles from, I think, the shortest 14,000 up to about 100,000 years in duration. And those changes bring about subtle uh, changes in the amount of solar energy coming into the Earth. And that is what drives uh, these glacial cycles. So, in fact, it's slightly, you could argue it's almost slightly more worrying that what must come first here is the, is the temperature and then the CO2. And that's quite credible, too, because as you warm up, uh, you thaw the tundra, you, uh, more uh, vegetable matter decomposes, and you get a, a rise in uh, CO2 um, into the atmosphere, driven by temperature. But also, we know very clearly that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It's opaque to infrared radiation. And we've known that very well since the middle of the last century, uh, sorry, the 19th century, uh, when uh, Tyndall first described this, in, based on laboratory experiments, looking at the opacity, essentially, of CO2 to infrared. It's a well-documented, uh, very well-understood uh, phenomenon. If we contract the time scale a bit, um, this is going back just 20,000 years now, and this is where we are today. This is looking at how we have how temperatures have changed over the last 10,000 years or so, 20,000. So here was the, the end of the last ice age. The last the sort of peak or the end of the last glacial maximum was about uh, 18,000 years ago was about the maximum. Generally thought about 12,000 years ago was the time we started coming out of the ice age. And uh, you can see that we rose quite rapidly in temperatures up to a level where they have been for about 10,000 years. There was, by the way, en route, a little blip here, which is an event known as the Younger, uh, Younger Dryas. And what happened was there was dramatic change in temperatures over a very short period of time when we went from a warming world to a freezing world and back to a warming world within decades. It was very possible to, to come about. And what's the, uh, my understanding from the climate scientists is that this is almost certainly to do with changes in the ocean circulations to, uh, to northern Europe because of meltwater diverting the, those salt currents, which are driven in part by uh, salinity of the density and temperature of the oceans. So it is quite possible for there to be very dramatic changes in a very short order. But the main thing is that if you look at the last 10,000 years, yes, there have been a few ups and downs. There's the kind of warm period in the medieval time when the Vikings landed in Greenland and we had vines growing in, in, uh, in Britain. Through to the Little Ice Age, where um, you could have frost fairs on the Thames in the middle of winter, lighting braziers and even uh, bonfires on, frozen, on the frozen Thames. Uh, those were brought about by changes of probably less than a degree, probably only about half a degree Celsius from where we are now, differences in temperature. But it has been remarkably constant. And now we're entering a phase where uh, it is unclear what the forward projection is. This was actually an old projection based on the 2001 International Governmental on, uh, Climate Change Panel uh, forecast of a central estimate of two, degrees, two to three degrees Celsius. But that is a substantial fraction. We are, the difference between the last glacial maximum now is about four to five degrees Celsius. So even two to three is almost equivalent to the difference between now and the last glacial maximum accomplished over the course of a few decades. But in fact, as you all may know, this is more up to date, it's still a few years old now, the 2007 uh, fourth assessment report. These are the projections, um, and uh, under these are all different scenarios about uh, assuming the way the world will evolve. But the central estimates vary considerably, and you can see that some of these give you very high, uh, very high estimates, uh, three, four, five Celsius. And worryingly at the moment, we tend to be at the top end of this emissions uh, spectrum rather than at the bottom end of it. And that would be, those sorts of changes would be, they have very appreciable changes on our environment. 
Um, but not necessarily in ways which we will fully understand, and it's very difficult to, to put everything in context, context and, to, under, and to, uh, to be able to project what those changes might be. Now, most of this, of course, is driven by our use of energy and our dedication to it. We are absolutely addicted to energy in everything we do. Um, but the world divides into those of low income and those of high income, and that is large, uh, that's partly between country phenomenon, but also within country. Um, driving all of this, the use of energy and our emissions of greenhouse gases, is partly population growth, but more of it is technology, technology and economic development because we have so much more per capita use of, of uh, CO2. Um, and of course, you know, if you go back long enough, when there was no mechanization, with, with no use of fossil fuels, um, even with a very world, large population, there would not be a problem. Those of us who in the higher income countries enjoy all the benefits of essentially centrally generated electricity, um, we suffer relatively modest uh, consequences of that because the air is a little bit contaminated by the, uh, by the power generation, but generally the, the public health impacts are rather modest. Um, there are some, some environmental, some occupational exposures, but the biggest route is the indirect impacts on climate because of the CO2 emissions. Those in lower income settings, they tend to have poor access to energy. They don't have enough energy, and that has a very substantial bearing on their own ability to fulfill their, their, their human potential. It means that they don't have access to all the things which we take for granted that contribute to their, to their health. They don't have refrigeration or the access to internet, all those things which I think most of us would find very difficult to live without these days. And because they, they tend to use sources inside their homes, they have extraordinary exposures, many of them, to indoor air pollution because they use... Uh, biomass, dung, wood, uh, things in the environment which they can use to burn, to cook, and heat with. So the local people have all the disbenefits of not having access to energy and all those that are related to the fact that they burn what is otherwise a renewable resource. Dung and, and wood in the environment tend to be quite renewable, but it, it gives very high concentrations of, of indoor air exposure. Whereas we, in the highest uh, income settings, tend to have the low impacts um, but we are contributing to, dominantly contributing to the global change through uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And we've managed to clean up in the, low income, in the high income countries our exposure to the traditional problems that we used to think about. So if you take air pollution, this is, this is the estimated um, PM10 concentrations in world cities. Uh, and you'll note that the UK, including London, is in the bottom quintile of this, uh, or bottom category of this five category uh, scale of PM10 concentrations. All of the polluted cities now, uh, most polluted cities are in places where we've essentially exported our industries to. We've exported our production to China, India, uh, Southeast Asia, South America and elsewhere. And it is those cities which now are serving our needs, also carrying our uh, CO2 emissions but also suffering from the uh, less well-controlled and less regulated uh, exposures to, to particle uh, concentrations. Um, and just to show the flip side of this, these are the deaths per million. Um, it's a, a while ago now, it's 2,000 estimate, but this is for indoor smoke based on solid fuels. So this is people burning in their homes uh, biomass to cook and heat with, and you see it's dominated by Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, and if you put these in, in context as well, um, the biggest killer that people talk about is usually uh, inadequate access to safe water. 1.73 million uh, deaths annually is one of the parts of the WHO estimate. Outdoor air pollution, about half that, less than half that, about 800,000. But indoor air is twice as much. So we tend to think of, out, of air pollution being an outdoor problem. If you're in most other countries of, of lower income, you would think of it as an indoor problem and on a par with inadequate access to uh, safe water. So that's all I was going to say really about the sort of the context of climate change and our use of energy. But now what, is, what, what do we need to worry about from a health perspective in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the health effects? 
Well, there are innumerable graphs and figures and sketches of all the connections, and you can dream them up until um, the cows come home. There, there are all sorts of connections. Almost everything you can think about has some sort of climate connection. But very broadly, the, the concerns, I guess, that come top of our list are those things, the regional weather changes, consequent to clim climate change. There are changes in temperatures, changes in extreme weather, and changes in precipitation. And they may have either direct effects, temperature-related illness and death, um, kind of Paris heat wave phenomenon, or they have indirect effects, which may affect uh, air pollution levels, transmission of uh, infectious diseases, vector-borne diseases, crop production, and other things. And, you know, this list on here, in the right-hand side here, <clears throat> you can have uh, a much longer list, um, depending on how you, how you define your connections, but clearly a whole variety of, of adverse effects, potentially, and some beneficial effects are, li are, are quite possible. Now, the thing which I suppose we tend to think of most uh, commonly in, uh, in Europe, at least for the time being, um, is the direct effect of temperature. And uh, the most obvious event of that kind was the August 2003. This is a, a Met Office map of the temperatures at uh, mid-afternoon on the 10th of August 2003. And you can see these uh, the temperature, uh, uh, most of these were at the high end, these were 40 Celsius uh, or thereabouts for large swathes of Europe. Um, and if you'd like to see what it does to uh, health statistics, well, these are data for London. Um, the this is the temperature trace here, and there is the heat wave peak itself. Um, and these, each of these, is a, each dot is the daily count of deaths across the year. So this is one year of data from January 2003 to beginning of 2004. So there's a, a seasonal swing with more deaths actually overall in winter than in summer. But this sharp spike is unmistakable, and that is the, uh, that's the effect of the heat wave in London. And if you do the calculations, it turns out there are about 2,000 deaths from heat uh, during, that, during that year. Now, to put that in context, that's only about a tenth of the annual average number of cold deaths in the UK. So we are kind of obsessed by the heat deaths, but actually uh, cold deaths for us is, is, is more important overall. Um, and moreover, there are most heat-related deaths in the UK occur not in heat waves, but on other days which are just warm. So uh, heat waves are not necessarily the thing to think about. But there is a very clear relationship between mortality, or in fact a lot of how health outcomes and temperature. Um, because I'm from London, I have the easiest access to London data. The, these are, again, the late London data turned round. But all this does, this is the temperature distribution, so temperature in Celsius here. This is maximum temperature. Um, and you can see the shape of this curve. And essentially, it's very precisely definable but using time series methods that we know from this sort of evidence that if you can tell me what today's temperature is, I can tell you how many people will die and I can tell you to within a very narrow margin because it's a very direct and clear relationship between temperature and mortality. And you can see that these are the constant bounds around it, uh, and it's pretty precise. We know, we know pretty much what, what's going to happen. And the important implication of that is uh, all you need to know what the public health burden is is a weather forecast. If you know what tomorrow's temperature is, I can tell you there'll be this many deaths. And, uh, and, it's, and it's pretty clear. Um, we tend to simplify. I've shown there what we, what's actually what we refer to as a spline curve. It's kind of allowed to bend, but what we often do is convert that into something which is a bit more like a two-piece straight line graph. And there is a bit where we say there's no heat effect and then a certain threshold, which is about 25 Celsius, 24.7 for London, um, at which you begin to see the takeoff of heat-related deaths. And at temperatures above that, Basically, for every degree Celsius it gets warmer, there is a corresponding increase in, in deaths. Um, and those sorts of curves you can see in almost any population you ever you care to choose to look at around the world. Um, and here are some ones. These are all low to middle income ones, but for example, here's Sophia. Um, so there's a straight bit and a, and a heat slope again there. These are all percentage changes. You know, 100 is the annual average. And here are the temperatures, of course. This is Delhi. This is Bangkok, even a troubled country, it's a bit tough to see, but there's a very steep part of that. And if you look at Monterey, this is Mexico, uh, not California, um, a very sharp U shape, and an incredibly steep part there at a certain threshold. Almost every population you come to look at, even in warm countries, you see those steep slopes. 
Now, we don't understand exactly what drives those relationships and how and why, but clearly it in indicates that there are sensitivities still to populations um, when the temperatures uh, change across the expected distribution and perhaps more so when they get to uh, unusual extremes. Now, I could go into a lot of different forms of health effects, but I'm not going to. I'm going to comment on just two others because I'll take the whole lecture talking about them otherwise. Um, but things I feel it's worth commenting on because there's often a debate about it. The first is vector-borne diseases. If, you, if we roll back about 10 years, there was a great deal of debate about the transmission potential of things like malaria coming to the UK. And it's all based on this sort of reasoning. These are all curves um, generated, I think, from my own institution, actually, some years ago, based on laboratory evidence. And they relate to various uh, aspects. This is, this is the mosquito itself, how often it bites and how long it survives. And this is the parasite, how long it takes to be incubated. And they all have a temperature dependence. So the biting frequency more or less goes up linearly with temperature. The survival probability is fairly flat and then falls off a cliff when it gets very high temperatures. And the incubation period gets shorter and shorter in kind of an exponential function as temperature increases. If you combine those, you generate the sort of curve you get here, which is a kind of multiplication or integration of those three. You get a transmission potential, which says how likely is it that malaria will transmit, and it has a temperature dependence. Uh, so the greatest, greatest uh, transmission occurs at sort of low 30s Celsius. Um, and from that, they say, okay, well, let's just take, let's say where we are now, and if you say we've got a country down here, the temperatures are, uh, mean temperatures in the 20s, and if under global warming, it's going to come up to here, you have increased the transmission potential uh, dr drastically. And that's what led to curves such as this. That's the basis, really, of this sort of map. What they've done is applied those curves, literally, and said, where are the temperatures now? What could they be in future? So where would it move us up on those transmission potential curves? And you end up with large parts of, uh, of Europe ending up uh, as uh, in the red, showing that there is uh, in much increased potential for malaria transmission. And there are a few areas in blue and green where actually the transmission potential might go down because they've gone over the other side of the curve. Um, and this sort of evidence initially caused a lot of debate and consternation saying, well, we're going to get a lot of malaria transmission. But actually, it's a very naive analysis. And I think the people that I know well uh, who did this would also acknowledge that and say, look, this is, not, this is not an appropriate way of seeing what our true risk is for two reasons. Um, the first of which is that uh, that is a relative change in risk. But if you apply a relative change to a very minimal risk in the first place, uh, the overall level of change is still may not amount to much. But the secondly, it only takes account of temperature. And actually, the thing which largely drives malaria distribution around the world is not just temperature. We used to have malaria in Europe, Germany, Scandinavia. If you read Dickens' novels, his descriptions of fevers and the eggs and things, though many of those were almost certainly malaria. We had it in, in Britain not much more than a century ago. It's gone now, not because our conditions aren't suitable to have malaria vectors and parasites, but simply because we've changed our way of living. We've uh, we've drained the marshy lands where the mosquitoes bred because we now have agriculture in most, in most land. We live in dwellings with close-fitting doors and windows. We don't get bitten. We have good health care. All those things, our general socioeconomic development has meant that malaria has been eradicated, essentially, and the risk is no longer there for us. So those socioeconomic factors have dominated and have meant that, we have, that malaria risk has gone away, even though we are actually now maybe half a degree warmer than we were a century ago. And there was an interesting paper published in Nature um, uh, about a year or so ago, maybe eight, nearly two years now, looking at the global change in malaria endemicity over a century. So this was comparing <coughs> records which could be structured of 1900 with the year 2000 or so, 2007 it looks like. Um, and this is what they constructed the curve for two, 1900 to look like, and this was 2000, and this is the difference. And essentially the blue means it's gone down, and the red has gone up, Well, there are very few red areas. Mm -hmm where malaria has increased, and everything else has gone down. And despite the fact that over that time, the, there has been a, a, an appreciable, not large, but an appreciable degree of global warming, um, about half a degree or so. Um, but they looked and tried to work out the different c contributions here, and, well, you can read this yourself. The proposed future effects of rising temperatures and endemicity are at least one order of magnitude smaller than changes observed since about 1900. 
and up to two orders of magnitude smaller than those that can be achieved by effective scale-up of key control measures. In other words, the things which we do now to control and the other societal environmental changes that have gone on over the last 100 years, those have had much bigger effects on the distribution of malaria so far than have any temperature changes. Uh, and if you extrapolate some of that, it, it suggests that the, the risk may be more moderate for the future than, than is sometimes acknowledged. Nonetheless, it's a very, uh, a very debatable area. There are, it uh, raises all sorts of uh, arguments and questions and debates. And it is a complex thing, and I think the jury is just simply out on what the overall impact is. But if you look at the burdens that the World Health Organization other than say, you know, well, where are the real burdens from climate change? Is it temperature? Well, actually, no, it's not directly temperature. They think the, the major ones are floods, malaria is a big one, diarrheal illness, because simply in a warmer world you get more diarrheal illness, and malnutrition due, they believe, because of the, the possibility of crop failures from uh, extreme weather events. Um, and there is one other thing which is sort of coming up on the outside track that people are talking about more, which is conflict. Um, a very difficult one to analyze and to, uh, to uh, assess, but essentially the notion goes that if you put any society in its environmental conditions under some form of stress, there is much more potential for there to be uh, conflict. And this was published in uh, June, July this year, I think, um, and a group from Columbia University uh, and they made a correlation, essentially, between uh, what they refer to, I think, as civil conflicts, political conflicts, I mean, le le leading to civil strife. Um, so not the sort of extreme wars, but the uh, civil conflicts um, in tropical countries which are affected by the El Nino uh, Southern Os Oscillation. That's what ENSO stands for, El Nino Southern Os Oscillation. And the reason they took this is because it's the world's biggest cyclical uh, global scale change in temperatures. It affects sea surface temperatures in the eastern Pacific, but which then have uh, effects right through to the, to the uh, western Pacific, the Indian Ocean, parts of Africa, and so on. And there are many tropical countries that were affected by the temperature swings. And essentially, the, uh, the, the key part of this is that the, the brown curve here relates to those countries which are genuinely affected by the, by the El Nino phenomenon and the blue are kind of control areas. They are ones which don't uh, experience the same um, change under El Nino conditions. And it plots the frequency of these are um, annual conflict risk. It plots that as a function uh, of these El Nino anomalies. So essentially this is kind of warmer than you expect against the average, and this is colder than you expect against the average. And there is a broadly straight line function, a bit of a wiggly one, but there is more or less a, a straight line function suggesting that, as they conclude, um, the El Nino phenomenon itself may have had a role in about 21% of all civil conflicts in the degree that you can apportion these things based on regression methods. Um, but they believe that the evidence provides an important, uh, important marker that stability of modern societies may in part relate to the fact that uh, we have stable climate, stable climatic conditions, which is actually quite unusual in geological terms. The Holocene, that last 10,000 years, has been very unusual in its stability. Um, and we kind of got used to it, but maybe we shouldn't be so used to it. And there is one other thing which is always worth mentioning, is that if you look at all those different health impacts, actually, um, even though I do research in the area, I get much less exercise about it than many of my colleagues, because actually when you look at, the, you add them all up, do they represent something which is a unique threat? And my conclusion to that is actually no. I mean, we already have global scale threats, HIV, AIDS, TB, malaria, lack of access to clean water, you know, you name it, millions die already, um, and billions are adversely affected. There is nothing different about climate change that says this is a uniquely, uniquely scaled challenge. But it is different in one sense, and that it has the potential to disrupt societies in ways which are really unfamiliar to all of us, and that may have quite... Uh, uh, quite uh, major consequences for all of us. And I like this summary that is Martin Rees, who's, uh, I think, Master of Trinity Cambridge, who's our Astronomer Royal. Um, he wrote a book called Our Final Century uh, a few years ago. And one of, the, one of his sentences talking about climate change says, if we could be absolutely sure that nothing more drastic than linear changes in the climate could occur, i.e. just marginal changes, we're just slow, slowly warming, or whatever it happens to be, it would be reassuring. 
the small chance of something really catastrophic is more worrying than the greater chance of less extreme events. And those uh, extreme events uh, could negate decades of economic and social advance. And I think that's part of the problem. It's, it's not so much the things which we can kind of live with. Most of us in the UK would probably welcome a little bit more warmth in the UK, but it's what it might do to the uh, you know, ocean circulations, to uh, collapse of, uh, of uh, species, all those sorts of things which are really beyond our way of, of, of understanding and cannot easily be modelled. So I'm going to turn to the solutions. And essentially, the, the basic point is here, we've got to do something about um, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere or equivalent. Now, when it comes down to it, there are, I suppose, I've given six different choices for us. And I kind of show things like this to our students and asking, you know, how would they pick? And I'm not going to do the same to you, but uh, you can start, kind of say, well, actually, I think we can do a bit of behavior change. Yeah, I'll save us 5 or 10%. And efficiency, oh, yeah, we can get 20 or 30% out of that. And then decarbonize, yeah, we'll do some of that too. And, you know, and they kind of build up the picture. Um, but let's look at these one by one. Now, the first thing is, how much do we have to reduce? And you probably know it is dramatic. This isn't a question of going to your supermarket and recycling your plastic bags. This is wholesale change in the way we use energy. Now, that may be really quite dramatic, or it could be that it's not so dramatic but it's based on technology, but it does mean a lot of change. This is the UK Climate Change Committee's trajectory. Uh, if you can't read the scale, this is we start in 2000 over here, 2050 there. By that time, we basically have to reduce, even on this report, our emissions by 80%. That is huge, and this is thought still to be insufficient. We probably have to reduce it by 90%, which is even huger. Uh, and that is really fundamental. You try living a day on 10% of the energy use that you currently have. It means you can run your television for about uh, 10 minutes. In your refrigerator, you can turn it on for an hour or so. And you're, you know, there are very few things you can do. Uh, and it's very hard, actually, not to use energy because of the way we structure our lives. You walk into a building, lights come on automatically these days and go off automatically, I suppose. But, you know, it's there. It's got to, we, we, we depend on all of these things. So the first question is, well, can we, get, can we just stop using some energy? Well, in many ways, you can say, yes, perhaps, and perhaps it's a good bit for health. If you look at the energy consumption here on the y x-axis against life expectancy, there clearly is a bit where there is apparently, I mean, it's all broad international comparisons, so it's not necessarily cause and effect. But at this end having a bit more energy probably lifts you up the, uh, the health spectrum quite a bit and improves your life years. But they get to a point about here somewhere where the more energy you've got, it's pretty flat. It doesn't actually do anything more. So we don't actually need all that energy. There we do, at that bit, pretty flat. Um, and you can make argument that some of the access to energy is now damaging health for reasons I'll explain in a moment. But this curve, or this thing, which I've taken from Gapminder, um, is one of the most depressing slides of all, because what it shows, and I've labeled some of the high users and low users, these are all the countries of the world for which you've got data, and there is pretty much a straight line curve, a straight line graph. In other words, uh, what it's doing, sorry, I should explain, it's, this is energy use on the y-axis against income. And it says, the richer you are, the more you use. And the more you use, the more you emit. And that applies within countries as well as outside, as well as between countries. And the reason that it's so depressing is because what it really tells you is almost whatever you choose to do, simply because you own the resources that you have, you will emit more. You will consume more and emit more. And you may think you can feel good about yourself one day because you say, oh, I'm not going to take that journey or I'm not going to take that flight. And you save yourself £100 or £200 or something or other. And what do you do? You go and buy something with it. The chances are you probably aren't just going to bury it in the ground. You'll do something with those £200. And everything you touch has embedded energy. You know, even buying a book. Well, buying a book may be quite a good thing, actually, because as long as you don't let the book decay when you finish reading it, um, it probably locks up CO2 for a bit. But generally, everything you do has embedded energy. And there is such a perfect correlation with wealth that it's very hard to see how you get, how you get around it. The good point is, and I don't have the slide for this here, but there is a slight tailing off 
if you have on the y-axis not energy but CO2 emissions because we have got used to having slightly more efficient use of, of um, uh, energy and its CO2 emissions in the higher income settings. But still, the dominant uh, marker of our emissions is wealth. And I find it very difficult to believe that there are many people who, who we can bring about any really real departure from that unless we change our technology. The second issue is, so that's sort of, for me, behavior doesn't do it much because whatever you do, there's sort of rebound phenomena in which case, just because of our wealth, we will use more in one way or another. The second uh, problem is that energy efficiency, commonly assumed to be a big savior, generally, the history tells us, leads to more, not less, consumption. And I give three examples. Street lighting. A uh, hundred years ago, street lights were about a twentieth as efficient as they now are. But all that's happened over that hundred years is we now use 20 times more emissions from our street lighting because in 1900, we'd light a few street corners. Now you can take a picture from a satellite on the dark side of the earth and the country lit up like a Christmas tree. We light our urban environments all the time. Why? Because it's cheap and we can do so. Motor vehicles are likewise. They are... 30 times more efficient, their engines are 30 times more efficient than they were a century ago, but all that's happened, it's gone from something that only a few thousand people could afford to billions. It's kind of a thing that everyone now owns. Air travel likewise. In fact, the, the gain in efficiency of air engines with a modern turbofan uh, is extraordinary by comparison with what it was um, 100 years ago, much more impressive even than for motor vehicles. So the problem is that generally our efficiency leads to more consumption because it just makes things cheaper for us to use. Well, you say, well, what about, there are some things which we can do which uh, surely we aren't going to, to change. And, and I may be persuadable that some aspects of household energy efficiency aren't quite such trade-offs. Um, although I'm not even convinced of that because if you think of the number of devices you now use in the home, it is much more than it was a year ago. When I, uh, years ago, when I was a child, we used to light the rooms in my home with one central light bulb. And, you know, we had a television. Now we have architectural lighting, we have lamps in all the corners and standard lamps and this. And they're more energy efficient, but there are now seven or eight of them where there used to be one. And we've not only got a television, we've got a DVD player and a hard disk recorder, and, you know, we've got mobile phones and computers and this, and it's endless. But what about the heating of our homes as well? Well, uh, essentially, people have noted much about the potential benefits of energy efficiency. Because if you insulate our homes in the UK in particular, we're very keen that it provides a greater warmth in winter, increased temperatures, which gives us beneficial effects through that added warmth in winter against kind respiratory illness, winter deaths, thermal comfort, psychosocial well-being, and so on. The potential downside is that there are, it alters ventilation because one of the things that the government through its building regulations is demanding, is that new builds and refurbishments increase the tightness of dwellings, cutting down air exchange. Um, but that in itself has certain problems because uh, if you do so, it's okay that it blocks out all those pollutants outside the home, but it keeps in all the pollutants generated inside. And that includes particles from combustion sources. It includes, if you're in the wrong area, radon. It includes, if you're in a smoking household, secondhand tobacco smoke. It includes VOCs, uh, volatile organic compounds and other things from furniture and so on. And not all of that is very good. And I'll show you some of the radon data in just a moment. Um, of course, it also you could, may use lower fuel use, and that will have benefits to your disposable income, which hopefully you'll spend on healthy things and not on cigarettes. But there may be benefits to, from these routes here. But it's a little bit complicated. Um, and here is... One of the radon example, I'm going to talk in a minute about nuclear, uh, nuclear energy. Um, where is the bigger risk of nuclear exposure for all of us? Well, actually, it's probably from this. And what happens? Radon, you know, it comes from the, uh, it's a daughter, it's a, a breakdown product um, of the uranium series. Uranium is part of the rocks all around us. It's in building materials. It's under the ground. There are certain areas of the UK which are quite high. Uh, the southwest... North Midlands, Peak District in particular. It's a bit round here, actually. Um, and uh, yes, it's something you can do something about, but it just leaches into the home. or It's a, it's a gas, uh, inert gas, radon. It goes into the home because the inside temp, uh, pressures tend to be lower. We heat the air, so there's a through flow of, of air. Temperature, pressures are lower, so it gets sucked in, and it builds up, and it's, and it's harmful. And I don't know how many of you would guess what it is, but the action level for radon in this country is 200 becquerels per cubic meter. 
Well, the risk of that at that level is a 3% lifetime risk of lung cancer. Well, that seems to me quite a lot. You say, okay, well, that's just the action level. Well, 5% of homes are at the action level and some many more. And what we're going to do by sealing up all our dwellings is just literally shift the distribution to higher radon concentrations overall. And actually, if you're worried about nuclear, nuclear uh, exposures from nuclear industry, you should worry about this first and then worry about the nuclear industry, as I'll show you in just a moment. Um, and just to put this in context, so this is the proportion of homes above 200 becquerels per cubic metre in the European Union, or rather actually Europe with, with some uh, uh, other ones here. And you can see that um, about half the countries have more than 5%. All of these, this, is, this one here, Serbia Montenegro, has got nearly 20%, 18% of its houses above 20 becquerels per cubic metre. And we're sealing them all up. So we have to be careful about these things. Now, you can do things to, to remediate this, but uh, you have to do remedial action. So energy efficiency can do some things, but you have to be a bit careful because there are some downsides, and, rate, and I've mentioned some of them in, in, in passing. So, okay, what about renewable energy? Well, I guess we all hope to do, get a lot from this, but it's not simple. Um, the problem with renewable energy are all these things here. First of all, it has a, a large land requirement. It's got low energy density. So whereas a power station, you just need a plot of land, a few football fields to generate your electricity. With renewable energy, you need acres and acres and acres and acres, or hectares. Um, it's intermittent. The sun doesn't always shine. The wind doesn't always blow. Uh, there are constraints on location, and there are environmental and aesthetic impacts and cost. It is very expensive, generally, to, do, to generate by renewable means. And I took this uh, chart. I don't know if you've read this book. Uh, I thoroughly recommend it. If you haven't, you can download it free, actually. It's by David McKay, who's a, a professor of physics at Cambridge, uh, now, I think, one of the chief uh, advisor, scientific advisor to DEFRA, one of the departments. I forget which. Um, and he wrote this book, which he, he basically called it uh, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. It's really about trying to present the facts about you know, what it is, the numbers of how you add up things. And he presented at some point a kind of for discussion, rather out of the blue, sort of these are plans which add up to, this is how we could meet our targets of reducing our energy consumption or CO2 emissions by 80%. And there are various plans here, and they all entail various different bits and pieces. And they all... All of them assume these things at the bottom. They all assume that 12% of our land is given over to biofuels. They all assume that 500 square meters per person is given over to the production of wood for us to burn. And they all assume that 2.5 square meters for every dwelling is given over to solar water. And those account for these little bits in the middle somewhere here. Um, so let's look at a few of these. Well, this one, um, it can, it's sort of a bit of everything and it adds another six square meters to this two, already two and a half square meters for every dwelling of photovoltaics. Pretty impossible actually to implement that if you can work out how, many, how much roof space there is, but that's kind of what it's assuming. Let's take some bigger ones. This one here, uh, it stands for, it's labeled Plan N. I think N stands for not in my backyard. And what it's all about is solar generation in the deserts of North Africa. Essentially, this is putting huge... 44-kilometer uh, circles, we need five of them in the Mediterranean desert region somewhere to collect solar energy and then to pipe it, probably through some direct current uh, network, high transmission network, to the rest of Europe. Uh, and we, in the UK, would need five, uh, five of them about 44 kilometers across. That's about the size of Greater London. Um, or you can say, all right, we'll, we'll go for this one down here. This is wind power, and that's a big fraction uh, but there are a couple of problems with that. Firstly, this is 120 times our current UK wind power production, even to get us that bit there. And what's more, it has to come with alternatives, either with pump storage or backup facilities. And I was interested to hear that Chris Hume referred to uh, the other day, uh, describing we'd probably need gas power stations to back up when the wind doesn't blow, because there are occasions in winter when essentially across the whole of the UK, the wind doesn't blow enough. And so whatever you capacity you've got, you've got to have a, a complete backup system. Um, or we could go nuclear, uh, and this is a big slice here, but this is 10 times our current nuclear power uh, uh, level. And the interesting thing is, if you go back uh, about five, six years, everyone in the European Union said, oh, we should have biofuels, that's our solution. And so there was this sort of uh, plan that we should all start growing things for, for biofuels, until in 2007, the world food prices started rocketing, and they suddenly said, well, maybe biofuels is a bit 
not the right solution because it's too much competition for land. So they say, well, we know the next plan is we'll put our solar collectors in North Africa until Tunisia and Libya and Egypt and Syria and all the um, this political instability. And so they say, mm, maybe it's not such a good idea to put, our, put all our energy production in the North African states. So they said, I know, it's now down to nuclear. And then we had Fukushima. And essentially, every plan that's come along, also the next bright idea, people realize it's not so easy. Everything has its downside. Now, um, this is uh, what I like to do. What I'm trying to hear is I'm going to now talk a little bit about an interesting commentary on some of the risk estimates. Um, this shows two things about electricity production, different forms of electricity production based on, on the x-axis is how much CO2 emissions they give per uh, kilowatt hour of production. And this shows the health impact on this axis. This is deaths, mainly from pollution and accidents, and this is causes of illness. And you notice that there is a fairly straight line curve. In other words, those things which give more CO2 emissions also give higher health impact. And that's largely because they are dirtier. Burning of fossil fuels, lignite, coal, and so on, contaminates the, the air and gives us adverse health effects. And right down in the bottom left-hand corner is nuclear. And so you kind of wonder, well, no, this can't be right. Um, because you know, everybody knows that nuclear is the, is the bad boy of them all. Um, but now is it interesting? So I thought I was going to show you a little bit of competition. Um, and you've got, to, you've got to guess the odd one out here. It's the Have I Got Public Health News For You quiz. And you've got to get the odd one out round. And there are four choices. Did go twirl around a bit. First choice, the Stanley knife. A bunch of bananas. Ronald Reed shoes and this gun. Any guesses? I should say I gave this to the students, the intake of new stu MSc students this year, and they got about 10 seconds, which I was very impressed by. It's given away, perhaps, if you remember who Ronald Reed is, the shoe bomber. The answer is the bunch of bananas. And why the bunch of bananas? It's the only one until 2001 that would have failed a routine airport screening uh, procedure for things that you cannot carry onto a plane. <coughs> this we sometimes refer to generically as the box cutter, 2000, the 2001 hijackers. This is Ronald Reed's uh, shoes. This is a titanium, entirely titanium uh, pistol and being non-ferrous uh, material is not picked up by the standard uh, uh, ferromagnetic uh, screeners. Why bananas? They are radioactive. Uh, they contain about 0.1 of a gram of potassium-40, and people have even said, oh yeah, we can define this as a banana equivalent dose when you're trying to talk about other things, because it's you know, a useful comparison. And uh, what is it? It's about 0.1 microsievert. Well, let's put this in context. Here is my banana equivalent dose, 0.1 uh, microsievert per banana. Now, I have a banana for lunch almost every day. Uh, from nuclear energy across the year, you'll get about 0.3 of a microsievert from all the nuclear releases that there are around the world, even with all the cat catastrophes there have been as well. Living in your house will give you about 200 microsieverts um, from the radon level, but that is higher in some dwellings where there's high radon concentrations, um, and about 600 from gamma from the building materials. And if you go on an air flight, you have about 1.5 to 5 per hour. So of all those things, nuclear energy doesn't come across really as a particularly dangerous risk. So background level's not so clear. And by the way, if you think, oh, it must be very different because it must be short-lived, well, when the Fukushima went up, the problem, of course, was iodine-131, half-life, eight days. Your potassium-40 from my lunch that I ate on the 30th of September when I spoke to the students, Half-life, 1.25 billion years. So it's a, it's, a different, it's a different risk. And, okay, so which of these, coal, hydro, nuclear, indoor biomass, which of those has the lowest greenhouse gas emissions? You guessed it, nuclear. Which of those has the smallest health impact? You guessed it, it's nuclear. Which of those has been rejected by at least one EU economy? Nuclear. Um, 
And uh, I, I went to a meeting in the States back in the summer where a colleague of mine that I worked with, he's, he does a bit a lot on indoor air pollution, but he put up this slide, which he, he couldn't resist doing. Uh, deaths annually from indoor air pollution across the world, about 1.5 million. Deaths from Chernobyl nuclear disaster, less than 100, probably about 60. So he concluded that Chernobyl a month would give rise to less than 0.05% of all the annual deaths from indoor air pollution. So in terms of risk, we are, it's, very different, uh, it's a very different scale. Now, for the for balance, because I'm not a spokesman for the nuclear industry, I don't own any shares in them, but it is a very different level of risk. This is the big overall impact that the WHO uh, decided of their assessment of Chernobyl. And they've had all these different categories of people, the liquidators, they are the people who cleaned up, residents in these uh, control zones and so on, and residents in very low contamination areas. And they said, well, there are possibly these exposures in, uh, uh, you see, what's, and these are the annual levels background, uh, sorry, background levels here. Um, and you can see that some of these are about the same as the annual background, but these are kind of additions. And if you do that, you say, well, there might be up to 4,000 cancer deaths and so on. So it's possible that Chernobyl has had bigger effect. But it's very difficult to see these. Nobody's really been able to see anything very dramatic from any routine uh, statistics. What we do know is there were a lot of uh, thyroid cancers in children, but they are preventable if you take iodine. Um, and very few of those have, have died. They've been cured, essentially. So if you go through the, the, the health concerns with nuclear power, firstly, exposure to radiation from nuclear sites, that's about three bananas. Thirdly, nuclear explosion. You cannot have a nuclear explosion because it is not weapons-grade material in a nuclear power station. It will not explode like an atomic bomb. Uh, it just simply is impossible because you have to have enriched material for a bomb to be exploded. You can have a dirty explosion, i.e. an explosion with the release of contamination to the environment, but it cannot be a nuclear explosion. Core meltdown, yes, it is a risk. And we've had two of those, as to my knowledge. Uh, we've had Chernobyl and we've had Fukushima, where there have been proper meltdowns. Um, but even so, there are fewer deaths than almost for any other energy source that you care to mention, including hydro. Terrorism, yes, there are risks with terrorism, but actually the biggest concern is, is plutonium-239, and there are plenty of stocks of plutonium-239 in, in the world at the moment because we've had nuclear disarmament. And all of those weapons have got, had plutonium stocks which are now sitting around in places around the world, and there is, there is evidence of trade going on. Actually, nuclear power stations can use some of that and get rid of some of the risk. Accidental re re leaks of radionuclides, yes, uncommon, but perhaps happen. How many deaths? Probably very, very, very few. A radioactive waste, isn't this a concern? Perhaps, but it's a millionth of the, of the volume of waste from hydrocarbon sources, burning coal or whatever it is. The small volume of high-level waste requiring safe long-term storage is tiny. Um, probably... All of the high-level waste that's ever been from all the 400 units around the world amounts to less than about two aircraft hangars. And if we can't find a way of storing that amount of material, we are, you know, that is a trivial problem compared with global warming. And reprocessing actually serves all sorts of useful functions, even uh, medical uses, generation radioisotopes, and so on. So there's a very interesting commentary on the way we, we, we look at risk because most people would think that nuclear risk is really an unpalatable option and the Green Movement for a long time is saying it's not the one we should have. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this because I've been going on too long and I don't really want... I was just going to talk a little bit about the future and it's not really important. But there's one last message I want to give. All the things I've talked about so far, so how can you kind of deal with the problem? But there is, a, there is a, another side to this and that is... We know we've got to bring about a lot of profound changes in the way we live our lives. And it may not be just behavioral, it's partly technological, and largely technological probably. But there are from that, there is potential for substantial public health benefit. And this is some work we, I was involved with uh, at my institute a year or so ago, um, looking at the public health benefits of strategies to reduce greenhouse gases, what it does as the sort of incidental benefits to it. And essentially, it's based on this sort of rationale. If you think about our modern environments, take vehicle transport as one example, but I could have chosen many others, it gives rise to all sorts of things. Yes, it's a major contributor to climate change because of vehicle emissions. It also has large burden of road injuries. We depend too much on motorized vehicles, so we become physically inactive, which gives rise to the obesity epidemic in part. It leads to chronic disease, uh, and physical activity directly is too. We have environmental pollution, 
which also gives rise to chronic disease. A lot of these have adverse bearing on mental well-being and including the noise. All of those are really rather negative things about the fact that we have motor vehicle dependent congested urban spaces. And if you can break that link and promote instead a shift towards active transport, of course you address all of them. And the motivation may not be primarily climate change at all. It might be rather that we want to address physical activity or our quality of life or the environmental pollution. Um, and we ran a number of scenarios looking at various areas, including household energy, transport, food and agriculture, electric generation, thinking what could be the sort of strategy you'd implement to look at climate change and what are the benefits for health? Well, here is the transport data for London, this was. And there were three scenarios looked at, if I can get the pointer to work. Um, the one on the left is the uh, is kind of, this is low carbon driving, meaning that the car was running on a clean fuel. So it was running on a battery, the fuel for which is generated by renewable means or something rather. So it removes the air pollution component. That has some impact. But there is a massively greater impact because this is the scale of, of health benefit. This is disability adjusted life years. There is a massive increase in the potential health benefit if you get people walking and cycling because they lose a bit of weight, they become physically fitter, and that addresses all the big killers, all the big chronic diseases for, for us in the UK. Heart disease, a uh, lot of cancers, dementia, and so on. Um, and the sustainable transport is kind of the combined of the two, but basically it's almost identical to the increased transport. Um, and these are the things which were modelled. We note, we even allowed for the fact that there were an increase in road traffic injuries um, going up because if there are more people walking and cycling, there will almost certainly be more road injuries. But those figures are dwarfed overall by the increase, uh, the decreases in skin heart disease, cerebral vascular disease, dementia, breast cancer, and many others which aren't listed. And we put a number of these things together um, to try to look at sort of, you know, where do these all map out? And I need to explain this a little bit, but this is uh, almost my last slide. This is sort of measure of health benefit. If you go upwards above the dotted line, that's improved health. This is disability adjusted life years saved per million of the population. And so if you're up here, you're saving a lot of lives. And, uh, and if you're to the right of the red curve, the red line, you are reducing your CO2 emissions. This is megatons of CO2 per million of the population. And so you're saving a, basically a ton per person out here, two tons per person if you're out here. And what we'd had is a variety of things. Some were in the high-income countries, some in low-income countries. Different measures. So you can see things like here, the Indian clean cook stoves to reduce all those all those indoor air particles from the biomass burning, that is a massive public health benefit, a huge benefit, but it has actually relatively little impact, but some benefit even on climate change-related emissions, CO2 emissions. Um, whereas other things have quite a large benefit on CO2 emissions, if you, ha if you can make China's electricity uh, uh, cleaner, for example, they have quite substantial impact on, on CO2 emissions. But nearly all of these things are some have appreciable co-benefits. They address one and the other. Here is London Sustainable Transport. It would make us much healthier in London, as well as having a big contribution to our overall reduction of CO2 emissions. This is, this is reducing, this UK food one here, is reducing the amount of saturated fat by 30%. By, oh, sorry, cutting meat and dairy by 30%. Not abolishing it, just reducing it by 30%, which probably we should all do and there would be appreciable gain from it. So, in my view, a lot of these things are, should not necessarily be motivated by climate change, but by health. So, here is my kind of take on these things overall. Firstly, the understood direct health consequences of climate change, by which I mean sort of heat waves and things of that kind, do not alone, in my mind, justify an unprecedented societal response. We already have big enough event, effects in the world at the moment that we are not dealing with, and climate change isn't really different from those. It is different to the extent that it, of course, has other changes to the environment which we may come to regret um, and which are irreversible. But it, I find the difficult very, uh, very difficult just to justify it in health alone. Secondly, behaviour change, in my view, because of, our, because of the relationship between our wealth and our use of resources, will never achieve more than a small reduction in energy consumption, behaviour alone. And its effect is likely to be overwhelmed by essentially technological and economic trends. Thirdly, behaviour change, however, could make a major contribution to population health. The major uncertainty is how to achieve that change. It's how to bring about more walking, cycling, healthier diets, uh, better insulated homes and those sorts of things. 
And so, for me, the major reduction uh, in dependence on carbonaceous fuels is justified, in part to tackle the very serious threats of climate change, but also because, and perhaps more so because, of concerns about energy security, current adverse effects of, of uh, health burdens, which could be addressed, and the potential for improving quality of life. All of those are very positive things. And I think we will come to realize very soon that uh, we should be doing all these things to improve our health. And I will echo the words of the Saudi Arabian oil minister some years ago, who said the oil age will end not for lack of oil, just as the stone age ended not for lack of stones. We will find something better to do, better, to, better ways of using energy. That's it. <laughs>